The following interview was conducted with Tony Samar for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, October the 16th, 2007 at the TV studio in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little Thank bit about you. where you were born and your parents and siblings in your early years. I was born in Chicago and uh, on February 16, 1930. Uh, my mother immigrated from South Carolina in the late 20s. My father was an immigrant from Mexico and he came into Chicago, crossed the uh, Laredo Bridge in 1924. And they both, they both eventually uh, met in Chicago. And so I'm a product of that meeting. Okay. Do you have any uh, siblings? I have a, I had a brother and he died in 1937. Okay. My mother died in 1940. Back in those days, uh, very difficult times, we had to live, my mother and my father were separated and she lived in what they call these garden apartments in Chicago, these apartments that were street level, and they had a dampness to them, and she contracted tuberculosis. She was placed in a, Mary Kelly up in, who was a mayor at the time, had a very nice sanitarium, tuberculosis sanitarium, uh, out on the north side of town, and she was able to get into that through friends. She went in in 1935, and in 1940 in December she died. She was there that whole time, though? She was there the whole time, all she, five years? Those five years. And I was only able to see her uh, once a year, like at the 4th of July. And I could see her off uh, a balcony. That was our only visitation up until she died in December of 1940. Oh, my goodness. What, did your, what was your father? Did, whereabouts did you live? In, did you live with your father then? You, I lived with my father, but my mother was discontent with my father, and she didn't want him to have me. I had a brother, and when my brother died, he became more interested in me because when my brother died in 37, he then became, began to take more interest in me. Well, she didn't want that to happen for reasons I don't know. Sure. Okay. But uh, she had me placed in a foster home. So I was raised by foster parents for many years. Okay. Did you have any contact with your father during that I time? I sure did. I, was, I had, my father had privileges to see me, and I would visit with him and so forth, and my stepmother uh, they lived on the west side, and the people that I was living with lived on the south side. So I had this south side, west side connection. <laughs> Where'd you go to high school? Tell us a little bit about being in high school. I went to Jean Baptiste Point Du Sable High School, which was one of the better schools on the south side. Uh, my guard, uh, my foster parents wanted me to to go to a good school, and I, I thought that at that time that uh, Point Du Sable High School was one of the better schools. Only two schools at that time that had black students, Wendell Phillips and DuSable High School. So I went to DuSable High School. Okay. Well, did you, any particular activities that you uh, engaged in while you were in high school? Yes, I was in uh, track. I was on a track team. Okay. I was in, uh, I did uh, poetry reading and so forth. And uh, I was very much, in, I've been interested in music all my life. And they had an outstanding music program at uh, DuSable under the uh, leadership of Captain Walter Dyad, one of the premier band directors at that time. But I never got involved with the band. I mostly became self, I mostly was, am self-taught as a musician, dating back to all that period, and I read up a lot. I had, I finally bought me a horn and a saxophone, and I started playing and learned at home. Self-taught, right? That's right. Okay. Uh, after high school, then what, what, uh, what were your plans when you went to college? How did that come about? I didn't go to college. Okay. Um, what did you do after you graduated from high school? Well, I found a job, and I worked uh, several locations. I worked uh, in factories. I worked for publishing houses, and I got involved in this uh, uh, printing business, uh, litho lithograph, uh, photo offset lithography. That's what they called it. And uh, I really enjoyed that, sure. and uh, I stayed there uh, until uh, I, uh, until the University of Illinois got took an interest in me. As a musician, I was doing performances around town, playing at parks in different locations and so forth. As a group, with a group. With a group, and uh, they were uh, they were aware that I was 
attracting people and a lot of interest and a lot of community people. In particular, a lot of college students would come out to hear us. And I had an outstanding band that was made up of college students, uh, some that have gone on to greater heights uh, uh, today and pretty famous today. And so that was a, the main key behind where I would go there. And so it just so happened that that popularity uh, gained the attention of the University of Illinois. And when they went through that period where they were establishing a culture center over there, the uh, Afro-American Cultural Program, they hired a director, Val Gray Ward, who was out of Chicago, and she only stayed one year, which was 1969-70. They hired me in 1970 as a director, and I was given, my musical knowledge was very respected, very much respected, and as I was a result of it, I was given a position in a school of music, of research associate. So I taught a class and, uh, and then established a lab band, they call them lab bands, where you come sort of like experimental playing and so forth, and then I directed the culture center there. And I must admit that that experience was one of the most rewarding that I'd ever had. I was just I awed at the fact that I was going into higher education and I had my own office and staff and everything and it was just tremendous. How long had the center, had the center been running for some time? Had the center been going for some time before no, you called? Uh, in 1969, was there was turmoil and conflict on college campuses. It was during that time period when Students were clamoring for cultural centers. There were riot, riots in someone at Cornell University, and there were uprisings on different, and it was a very tumultuous period for universities because they didn't know what these students were clamoring for. In addition to that, the war in Vietnam was going on, and that helped to complicate matters a lot. So uh, uh, that part of it uh, all helped me in terms of uh, coming into the university, bringing something of credit uh, and, and being accepted by the students. The students just loved me, and they thought that I would make a good, they, they wanted me for their director, and that's how it turned out. Good. In this time, did you keep in touch with your foster parents? Your foster parents, did you keep in touch with them? Yes, I okay. did. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, they passed away oh. right after I had uh, left home. Okay. Um, I was, uh, my mentor was my foster parent on the male side. Uh, his name was Raymond, John Raymond Dennis, and he was from Ufala, Oklahoma. And he was a brilliant man, and he was self-taught. And so I learned a lot from him Good. because he wor worked uh, on these big presses and everything, and he was just outstanding, gear presses as they call them, uh, for General Motors in, in uh, LaGrange, Illinois. Uh, and so I, I learned a lot from him. He was, I couldn't have had a better uh, role model than Mr. Dennis. Good. Now, Mrs. Uh, Dennis, they were both from Champaign, Illinois. They came there and operated uh, the food service at one of the residence halls there, and then eventually moved up to Chicago, and that's how, they, how we met each other. Okay. What a small world. And then you ended up going there, right. Huh? To, you then, then you went to Champaign. Yes. Where they had come from. And how long were you then, how long were you there, and then uh, that probably brings you to Purdue, is that right? How long was I where? How long were you in Illinois, and then your next step was? I uh, was at the University of Illinois. I have to tell you this story. Okay. I went, I was appointed a director. I never was so overwhelmed in all my life. Uh, and I started my position in 1970. I only lasted one year. And the lady before me, she didn't last a year. A lot of pressure on the individuals who were in the capacity of leadership because you were torn between trying to uh, placate or show um, reference to the people that you were there to help and then you had the university so you're being pulled both ways. A lot of tremendous amount of pressure and so I said this this will kill me. I, I, there's no job that should take that much out of a person so in 1971, I resigned after one year. I did a remarkable job there in that one year, mm -hmm. and that still stands today in terms of the credit. Even in one year, I was amazed. Very, very good. And then what, then what happened? What, what, what next? Well, I stepped, I, I resigned, and I decided, well, I'll just play music. And uh, there was a young lady from Champaign who was a Purdue student. Her name was Cheryl White Mason. 
And she came to visit me. She heard of my work. And she, she knew me, and she said, uh, why don't you come to Purdue? We have an opening there. We have a, a cultural center. We'd love to have you. So I studied around, thought about it and everything. So I decided to visit. So I came over to visit the cultural center. At that time, Singer Buchanan, I don't know if you remember him. And the name I remember. Singer Buchanan was the coordinator of black student programs. So I came over here in 1972 to initially look at things and to see what the center was like. And I was really thought, well, this is another headache, <laughs> another big headache. Was, but, was it the house? Is that, did they have the It house was a house there? at 315 University Street. Where I first met you. When that's you there, correct. Right? That's correct. Okay. And uh, uh, that was the old Baptist Student Center. It turned out to be the oldest building on campus aside from University Hall. It was built in 1905. But anyway, uh, I accepted. I was offered the position. I turned out to be the top candidate. I think there were five or six of us. And I was offered the position of directing the Culture Center by Mr. John C. Smalley, Jack Smalley, who was director of the union. I also was asked that I want a teaching position, uh, in the, but they have, no, they have no school of music here. So I didn't want to take on another position that would put more pressure on me because it's such a drain on you trying to direct the program, particularly in those innovative fledging years. But I was given an assistant to the direct, director position at the Purdue Memorial Union. My role as the assistant director was to help the union, the Purdue Memorial Union, increase black participation and to assist them in terms of helping to get more students involved in the activities of the Purdue Memorial Union. So it was another tremendous task. It sounds it, yeah, okay. Well, when you were appointed in 1973, the, you said the general purpose of the Black Cultural Center, which was started in 1970, is to serve the sociological, intellectual, cultural, and psychological needs of both black and non-black communities of the university. Its aim is to help foster understanding, cooperation, and mutual respect among the races. That's good. So now as your director, what were some of the challenges and uh, the mission and your interaction with staff? Tell us a little bit about uh, your days with the Black Cultural Center. Well, you have to understand that one of the things that happens when you come in with a program that's new to the university, there's a lot of suspects, a suspicion. One it was of the a brand new program at that time. Brand new program, okay. misunderstanding, mistrust. But what uh, fell on me was the fact that the students didn't know who I was. Who is this Antonio Zamora? They didn't perceive me as a black person. Uh, and so as a result of it, I was always under scrutiny, not only by the students, but by the university itself. So as a result of it, I had to come in and somehow demonstrate that I was credible and validate uh, all that I was uh, capable of doing. Very tough years. Um, and as a result of it, I just came in, didn't change anything. I decided that I would just do hard work and I would win them over by demonstrating that I was in, my intentions were good and I was committed to that program and to do the best that I could. Sure. And that's what happened. Okay. The notion of... Uh, Let me ask you one thing. Did they have any kind of a program in existence prior to you coming? Was there any... The house was there, so was there anything... Well, they did. Oh. Uh, they had... Uh, when, they, when they established the cultural center there at 315, they really had initially a house manager. That person was Nettie Hubbard. Uh, they asked a Purdue graduate student, Johnny Houston, would he put aside his PhD for one year and serve as a interim director until the search could be completed. Mm -hmm. okay. And so I came in after that search, I was selected and came in to be the director. Okay. They, he had established some things. They had, uh, the key thing I think the university was looking at, and as well as I saw, was that they were looking for something to quell the students, to, to, under, to get them somehow to adjust to the university and not have a lot of things going on that was disruptive. One of the major things about the Cultural Center was it was employment opportunity. So we had 25 jobs there were created, and they were student jobs where we paid the student scales, and then they were work-study jobs. And so what, I, what I, they had done was 
uh, the students kept up the center themselves, service workers, librarians, and they had started a small library, uh, but they didn't have a full-time library. It was a student who operated the library, uh, Sharon Hyler at the time. So I had to meet all these people, and I said, well, this is a tremendous opportunity because the things called for, the budget called for, uh, the funding for employing 25 students, of which some of them would be workshop coordinators who, who, headed, who were the heads of these workshops in dance, drama, uh, theater, choral singing, and martial arts. And so as a result of it, uh, uh, we started, I started taking those programmers and developing them and trying to get more interest and attract students to come into the cultural center so that they would uh, demonstrate something that would help us to build on what needed to be to represent the university and the cultural center very well. Sure. Okay. So you had something to start with anyway. You had something to start with. Well, yes, I did. Sure. And um, I, um, I uh, implemented a lot of new things. I came from Illinois with a lot of ideas. Good. Well, that, that's what we, we want to share that with researchers. Go ahead. Some of the things that you well, implemented. Well, the thing that I first thing I did was uh, uh, to coordinate those workshops, create a um, uh, organizational chart. Well, called like who does what, because students I think at that time were just randomly just doing things, so I had to sort of wait it out until the dust settled, until they found out that I was serious, and as a result of it, I had no help. But in the interim, some graduate students and other people saw that I was alone and decided to come and help me and ask me, did you need help? Uh, one of them was Phoebe Bailey, a couple other ones, Bailey Baker. And uh, you need help. And they came over and helped me to get things started. Uh, we created a newsletter, and, 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 and including writing a prospectus for us, for it, and, and, and then employing four students. And what we did, with each position, we found out something that would fit into that, that would fit their career objectives, okay. like reporting or writing and so forth. And that's how we got them to be involved. Uh, and then we started um, a cultural arts festival. The cultural arts festival was to allow those groups to come together and to commemorate the founding of the BCC in 1969. And with that, we started putting on these extravagandas and so forth. That happened in 1974. Okay. And it went on and it's still going today. That's right. One of the first was you started that artist in residence. You had an uh, artist in resident program. Uh, that was something new. And Stanley Butts was one of the first ones that was here in 1977. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the artist in resident program was created to provide professional assistance to the workshop coordinators by having someone who can show them along and help them to commemorate, to uh, create and do things with some substance to it. And they were, they were excellent. We had uh, Stanley Butts, uh, Darlene Blackburn in dance, uh, different people. Uh, and and uh, who did I have in theater? I had somebody, in, some of my mind's a little foggy on some of it. So much to remember. Oh, yeah. But uh, we, had, we had an artistic director for each one of those programs. Mm -hmm. And you had the black, uh, the black voices of inspiration. Was I that named was, that group. Was that that was a new group? Or well, it, what it was was that it was no a group. It was a new group. Oh. What happened is that three students came to see me. One from Africa, a young lady uh, from Orange, New Jersey, named uh, Deborah Silver, and said they wanted to start start a choir. And I said that's great because. The University of Illinois had an outstanding choir over there called the IU Black Chorus, and I know the direct, knew the director. And uh, what happened is that we started out with these students coordinating and everything, and it kept getting better and better and larger and larger. And uh, eventually it grew to 140 students. That was the magnitude of how large it had gotten. This Black Voices of Inspiration? The Black Voices of Inspiration. Wow. BVOI was uh, the acronym for them. And uh, just a, one of our most uh, requested groups because they performed off campus right. and on campus. I also established 
a cultural exchange program. What was that? Tell us about that. What was, uh, what the that cultural mean? exchange program was to allow these groups to have an opportunity to perform somewhere. And that cultural exchange meant that I had contacted other Midwest universities who had similar activities going on, and we would exchange. We would go to their campus, and they could come to our campus. It flourished. It just flourished. Good. Another group that you had was the uh, the Jacardi dance troupe. Was that uh, something new, or had that been in existence before? Well, that you was came? there when I came there. Uh -huh. Jahari means the jewel. That's a sweet uh, uh, Swahili word. Uh -huh. Means the jewels. Uh, they uh, were already in in progress, and a young lady named Deborah, I can't remember her last name now, had started that group from from Gary, and I began to look at how we could strengthen them, and I brought in. Uh, there were several young girls who were from Gary who had dance uh, skills and so forth and technique and teaching ability, and they brought that thing up, and we would put on these productions. So I would buy materials for them and get everything for costumes and so forth, and they would put on it, and they were just a powerful group. They still are today. That's right, yeah. You had quite a few. That cultural arts center was good. And then you had the New Directional Players was another yes. group, and the Haraki, the writers group, too. Haraka. Right. Yeah, haraka, which means to express and swallow. These young people had a lot of things that they had picked up that were different. And uh, I went right along with the program because <laughs> I had an understanding of it and a feel for what, uh, uh, I guess, a feel for Africa and, and, its, and its relationship to African Americans. Mm -hmm. And that was a core thing that I could use to bring them into the fold of what we were doing. Sure, right. Did you have an assist, any help about an assistant director? Did you have any assistants helping you over there? Well, what happened was that I created three new positions. Okay. FTEs. I created a position of assistant director. I hired our first assistant director. I also created a position for um, a full-time librarian. We only had a student librarian. I created a full-time librarian. And then I created a position for a um, night operations manager because the center was open from 8 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And a lot of activities went on at night. So there needed to be somebody responsible who was there to, to coordinate sure. things and see that sure. everything went along smoothly. Right. Yeah. You had uh, quite, a, uh, quite a speaker's listing some of the ones that were there that you had Muhammad Ali and uh, Julian Vaughn and Stokely Carmichael came at different times and talked. How did that, those come about? Was that uh, something that, that you would touch base with them or? Well, a lot of these people like? I had knew. I didn't know personally, but I knew how to contact them. Okay. Um, some of them I did know uh, through other people who knew me. And as a res what happened was that Julian Vaughn, uh, one of the best people we brought here was uh, James Baldwin, brilliant man. He was sick when we brought him here. And, and we went to his room and talked to him, and he was just a brilliant man. Maya Angelou, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just a brilliant woman. She liked sherry. So we went to, my wife and I went to her room, and she pulled out this bottle of sherry. <laughs> and we just talked and talked and talked. So they like to share things with you and talk with you. Uh, Nikki Giovanni. Uh, and I also focused the speakers and things, the artists and residents, artists and residents and speakers, prominent speakers. And so we would look at people uh, as historians. I had a collective of historians, John Hope Franklin, who, was a, who established the uh, Phi Beta program at Purdue. He instilled that program here. Phi Beta Kappa, I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then... Uh, uh, John Henry Clark, a noted historian. Uh, it's unfortunate, mostly people are deceased now. Well, you had Judge Higginbottom came here too. Well, and Higginbottom he, came he, through Africana Studies. Oh, was that a program that was in? Uh, that was the, the, we were, that was the Black Studies program. Okay, okay. The whole notion of uh, sister programs, the Black Studies program was strictly about teaching courses on African American okay. information. Our arm was, uh, and I looked at that as a theoretical po component. I saw the cultural center as the uh, performing arts component. The theoretical, one was theoretical and the other was, I remember the word slipping me now, applied. Applied, okay. We used the applied arts. 
our thinking was that what they learn in the classroom can be applied as, as a result of it, and we'd use those programs to bring that along and to, to reinforce who they were, confidence building, and give them more knowledge of how that can work. It was great, just great. Mm -hmm. It worked very well then. Uh, then, of course, you had, you had many things. You had the, uh, an after-dinner lecture series. You just had, uh, and you had uh, Samuel Hay at one time, who was the chair of the African Studies program yes. at that time here. Okay. And then um, one of the things, Black History Month, that was kind of a big, big thing that. Uh, well, that was in vogue when I came in, uh -huh. and I just took it and embellished takes, it. This takes a lot of planning, though, doesn't it, to get these programs going? Well, I was a workaholic, and uh, I felt that a great deal of respect for the students because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. As a result of it, I uh, kept building on these different things and imp implementing things that I knew that would work. Uh, and I would discuss things with them because I wasn't just doing on my own. I wanted to be in tandem with what they wanted to do and what they appreciated and would acknowledge and be involved in. Uh, so that was the, uh, that particular part of it. Yeah, and then you have alumni. You, st you had an alumni speaker at one time, a ser series, and then did some of the alumni come back and you kept in they kept in touch with them? Well, I, what I did was I had an alumni speaker series. Okay. And what that was to do was to uh, build off of the other speakers who came in because there were alumni who were very successful. Joe Very Carroll, right. I brought him in. Um, I saw you had him here. Uh, Eugene Parker, uh, different ones who had made their presence known in the, in the real world. Mm -hmm. And as a result of it, they kept... Uh, they came in, and their interaction with, with the students was just tremendous because they could share things related to their period at Purdue and, 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 and then share that with them so that they would, they would uh, grow from that. Right. Uh, I brought in uh, Ruby D and Ozzie Davis. And one of the most amazing things, Ozzie Davis, we had a conference room in the, in the Culture Center, and we would bring in uh, uh, people. When Ozzie Davis would come, he would come into the room and he'd tell these stories, just mesmerize everybody. <laughs> it was just wonderful because he, met, he spoke of a time that he and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King all met at his house and how they, they discussed things, the, the, the crisis of what was happening uh, in America and so forth. And I think the students just bewildered. Uh, and, and what enrichment are you bringing into their lives? Tremendous, tremendous enrichment. Sure. For me too. That's right, because, exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, and then, of course, you had the, uh, um, Dr. Lowry came one time for Martin Luther King Day. Uh, Joseph Lowry, who had worked with him. Yes, yeah, So he yes. came, too. One thing, uh, you had kind of a big celebration for the 10th anniversary of the Black Cultural Center. What, tell us a little bit about that. Well, what happened was that I decided that we would, uh, we should have an anniversary. And that uh, the well, 10th it was 10 years, so you had a date. Yeah, 10, 10, I had a date to do it. It was December <laughs> the 5th and the 6th, 1980. Okay. And uh, we put on a, 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 the 5th and the 6th was to commemorate the founding of the Black Culture Center in 1969 on December the, uh, the 4th. And so we put this big event on and had this 10th anniversary. But one of the main things we did was we uh, put on a black alumni reunion, Purdue Black Alumni Reunion, in addition to that. Was there, was there that, did that association exist before that, or was there a black alumni never, group? Never, never. Nothing ever done like that. And so in order to find out who the black alumni were and where were they, I went to the Purdue Alumni Association. Well, I found out they hadn't codified any of the records of alumni. It was, by that time, they didn't have addresses or nothing. They did, but they did codify, codify them by race. Mm -hmm. So I got a pool of students and sent them to research and look at all the debris oh, my Lord. to identify the blacks that they could. And out of that, we come up with about a thousand black alumni. Wow. That must have taken some time. It did. It, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work, hard work. And so we found it and went to the Alumni Association and then see if we could match them up with addresses. 
And we sent all those letters out, I think 1,200 letters, to the different ones that, and a lot of these people were deceased or didn't want to come back for a variety of reasons, didn't, couldn't come for other commitments. But we could finally ended up getting 160 black alumni to come back to Purdue and uh, for this particular event. And it was just fantastic. Some of them uh, uh, were pleased to come back. I guess to me, in my opinion, most of the black alumni were just gratified that they had made it through Purdue because it was a trying situation for them. So they had been successful and so forth. And uh, as a, so then we kept uh, just making progress and we, uh, uh, I guess I'm kind of stuck right there. Mm. What, what was the, old, the, uh, uh, the class for the oldest class that came, do you remember? I don't far remember. Back? But I don't did remember. They, you went all the way up to maybe oh, 19? Well, we didn't do that. We, didn't, okay. we just were so glad to get the people that okay. came here. Okay. And then that was the first time. They'd never been, they hadn't been back, hadn't thought about coming back in years. And I don't think, unfortunately, Purdue had never outreached to them. But they had no way of knowing who was sure. who, just based on uh, racial identity. Um, what sort of program did you have? What sort of activities? What sort of activities did you have for I them? I had a series of uh, seminars. And I looked at all of the uh, areas that the various people had matriculated in and set up a series of seminars here in the Stewart Center on engineering, athletics. Uh, people had a variety of uh, disciplines and we focused around that. I, in fact, I should have brought that program. And um, uh, we recorded all of them. And uh, we brought in different people. I'm trying, trying to remember some of them. But uh, wasn't Julian, did Julian Bond come for that? Huh? Did Julian Bond, was he one of the speakers for that one or not? No, or he another wasn't. time? No, okay. he wasn't. Okay. Uh, but the nice thing of that is that the person that I, I guess I should tell you this history. It's not a beautiful story, but when in 1946, that's when A. Leon Higginbottom enrolled in Purdue as a freshman to be an engineer. He was, uh, was not allowed to live on campus because even as a freshman and all coeds were required to live in campus housing. When he went to get campus housing, he was told that he couldn't live there. And so he lived in a resident hall, a resident home, and he was placed up in an attic in the wintertime and snowed through there. It was cold and he couldn't study. So he made an appointment to see the chief administrator, the university president, and uh, he, he explained the situation to, to the president, and the president told him, says, well, and he, he wrote a book about this. There's a book in the library called In the Matter of Color hmm. by A. Leon Higginbottom. The president told him, said, Higginbottom, that's the way it is. And if you don't like it, you can just leave. That's verbatim. Hmm. And so he did leave. And he went on to become a federal judge, hmm. U.S. federal judge in, in the state of Pennsylvania. And Africana Studies invited him back to speak some years, to, as a speaker some years later. And the university then invite President Hanson invite him to his home afterwards and I guess they made a tone for whatever went down but it was just wonderful. Yeah. Um, he passed away a few years ago didn't he? He did. He yeah. did. He did. Right. A wonderful man. He was yeah. a big man and very articulate and impressive you know. Oh sure. And uh, I, I spent time with him and I really enjoyed him a lot. We were a uh, lot like me. You learn a lot from the people that come and they're they share, just like the oral history program, for the researchers, you're sharing your experiences in the Lahancean history of the university, which is great. I mean, that's what we're doing, which is wonderful. In addition to that, I have great admiration for Frederick L. Hubday. Because of what happened to uh, A. Leon Higginbottom, you know, things just don't die. They roll over and somebody else inherits it. There was a man named Carter, James Carter, who was an educator in Indianapolis. And he brought his daughters up here to attend Purdue in, 19, in the 50s. He had two daughters and uh, 
He brought with him a professional doctor, a white doctor, who was a colleague and a respected colleague. And uh, they went and applied for, he went over and applied for housing. And he was told that there was no housing available after they found out they were black. So then the doctor, who was his friend, went over to housing and said, I have a daughter, uh, wanted to enroll her in housing. And they said, yeah, we have housing. So they took that information and went to the dean of students office, or, or, or they had dean of women and dean of men at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and also Helen Slayman. I don't know if you remember her or not. I, I met her a few times. But. but she was a fighter for women's rights and a fighter for things that needed to be justice, uh, to do justice to, to the students' rights. Uh, she, anyway, uh, sort of tried to, to carry that case on to President Hovde. President Hovde eventually, they went to the, this Mr. Carter went to President Hovde and explained the situation to him. President Hubbard told him, says, uh, Mr. Carter, the timing is not right. It just isn't the time to do this. And maybe just give me time and I will such and such, you know, we'll, we'll, the country is in such a state that we just couldn't do this. I guess it's just a lot of people, a lot of prejudice. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, in 1969, a hundred students marched on Hovde Hall with bricks in their hand and carrying a banner that said, The Fire Next Time, which was a statement made by James Baldwin. I think that impacted on President Hovde. And he then went around the business of creating the Black Culture Center. He established the Black Culture Center in 1969. Him and another scholar, um, that uh, came here from Michigan. I can't think of his name now. Uh, he's, uh, well, what's his name? Anyway, uh, they created, and, they, and I have these documents. I have all these documents of the letters that were written and uh, of his speech. He gave a tremendous speech. Uh, and about. When, when the center opened or, or at, at the time? That was before it opened. Okay. And he said, we're going to do this, and we hope that you will take advantage and use this, and that it will benefit all people. Sure. And that would put, put it in motion. That started everything to rolling. Uh, just a, a great man. I have, and, 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 and there's a part of the story I think is really interesting. When we had that 10th anniversary, I invited him. And he was in, up in age then. Sure. And he came to the event and he spoke. And, and he said, and I gave him a plaque. It was a founder's plaque. We gave our founder's plaques. And when I gave him that plaque, he just looked at it and stared at it. And he said, you know, I didn't think anybody would remember. It touched me, brought tears to my eyes. I bet, I feel the same way, yeah. And he just touched me because he was someone who was an intellectual, he was key, key, uh, I don't know if you know of uh, Harris. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Harris. Uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Was uh, he a, a Purdue? Was a local oh. athlete. Lived here. Went to Purdue oh. and played basketball with Hovde's son, and would come by the house all the time and talk and so forth. Uh, and we we communicate today. We have a good old good friend, Harold Harris. He was a professional musician. And he played piano up at the uh, uh, the club up in the, um, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the club up in, in Chicago. In, oh, in, oh, someplace in Chicago. In, uh, okay. Okay. Where they you know, had these bunnies. The Playboy? Playboy Club. He played at the Playboy Club. And he would come down here because his family lived. He was born, I think he was born and raised here. Harold Harris is still alive today. And we, we, we didn't talk. Because he commends me on the work that I've done. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> oh, um, you one you talked about the library, and that really is kind of strong. You built up the library. You, you said you've got a librarian uh, and the, the Black Cultural Center, right? Library. Which well, was really the thing good. was is that when I was at Illinois, they didn't have a library, and I felt it was very important for us to have a library. Although 
the University of Illinois has one of the best libraries in the country. And so I hired two library majors, uh, media, you know, in, in, in media and library science students to implement and build that. And they had a person over there who was their mentor, teacher, and so forth. So when I came to uh, Purdue, I was surprised that they had a semblance of a library there, but it wasn't organized. It was organized, but they didn't. My point was, how do you institutionalize things where they'll last? <laughs> and so or you can find things when you need right, them. That's right, that's <laughs> right. And so that, that's what, why I moved towards the library. And we created uh, library aides, which were student positions, which allowed them to have a job. Sure. But if they were in the library sciences, that would enhance their careers. Exactly, right. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Let's talk a little bit about some of your honors and awards. You got in 1980, the University of Illinois, the Black Alumni Association gave you the Cultural Arts Award. Yes. Yes. And then you got, how about the Sagamore of the Wabash? Did you get a Sagamore of the Wabash? Yes, I did. How'd that come about? I think that came about through uh, Sheila Klinker. Well, did the, how, did, did they let, how did they let you know? Uh, I think she let me know. Uh, I did, was surprised. Did they have some sort of an event? They had to do something. No, they, I just, uh, oh no, I, uh, it was at my retirement dinner. Uh, my retirement dinner was in 1995 in the Union. And they put on a real nice, it was just great. And we had this all kind of people from all over the country who came. And uh, one of the things they presented me with was a, a, a plaque from the uh, Purdue Black Caucus of Faculty and Staff. And then Sheila Klinker was instrumental in seeing that I got a, a uh, Sagamore of the Wall Bash. Oh, that's nice. It that's was just fantastic. Yeah. You also have the uh, 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 Tony Zamora Endowment Fund. Was that set up at, at your retirement? That's really, that really was. Uh, uh, Tell us a little bit about that fund. Well, it, it initially started out as a Purdue and uh, the Black Culture Center Endowment Fund. Uh, I implemented that and set that up and, and contributed to it, and I got other people. Among those people who contributed were many whites. Jack Smalley, uh, 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 John O'Haver, um, Melvin Hughes from the union staff, because I was on the union staff and they were my colleagues. Sure. And so uh, they knew me and respected me and as a result. And then a lot of people across, uh, Harrison Flint was a, a, a major contributor. And so it built up and kept building up and building up. So when I retired, Renee, Thomas changed the name to Tony Zamora, uh, Antonio Zamora Endowment Fund. Okay. And that's what it is today. Yeah, that's very nice. What brought your, why'd you decide to uh, retire? You'd, you could have stayed on. Did you, what, what brought your thoughts about retiring? Hmm? I was worn out. Uh, I, I, I guess I had given a lot, a lot, and my health was not in the best. I had had, um, a major ailment, pheochromosotoma. I had bilateral tumors on my adrenal glands, a rare ailment that was, uh, a, a, it was a case study because I went up to Mayo Clinic and they removed one of the, uh, my kidneys, not my kidneys, adrenal glands. I had an adrenalectomy. They did a full adrenalectomy on my right side, on my left side and did a partial over here. The partial allowed me to, so they said if I, they removed both of them, I would have to be on prednisone for the rest of my life. But we'll take a chance, if we can do this partial, if that works and kicks in, you'll be okay. And that's what happened. Good, that's nice. Yeah. I've been blessed. Uh, that's right, okay. Now you're retirement, you, are, you kept active in the music. What other things have you been involved in since you retired? I. Uh, I do some, I keep involved in the music. I speak on occasion, and I am now called upon by many Purdue alumni to mentor their kids. The strange thing is I've seen, and you probably noticed this too, the students that I had when I was here, they're now sending their kids here, and they want them to meet Mr. Zamora. So, that's is, just, yeah, is the Black Alumni, is that group still going, isn't it? The black? Yes, it is. You're, so you really sort of started that as a result of that 10th I did, anniversary? Well, what I didn't start it, oh. what happened was that we had that 
event for the anniversary mm -hmm. and you got the names of the people. What happened was that a group of the alumni came to me and said, you've done a wonderful thing. We want to recognize you and we want to carry this on. So we're going to come back and see that we can start implement a black Purdue Black Alumni Organization. I named that PBAO. Supposed to mean uh, some about progress and organization, <laughs> and uh, it has now taken off and it's on its own. I have nothing very much to do with it now, except I know a lot of the alumni and so sure, forth. Sure, right. And they they come back for the they, you, come, they come back once a year or something, don't they? They come back. They come. They have their meetings. They put out a newsletter, and they were under the uh, auspices of the Purdue Alumni Association as special as a special sponsorship, uh, and I've just. Just worked out wonderfully. Yeah. Now, when you when you came, Dr. Hansen was the president, and then when then Dr. Barron came in. So you you were served under two presidents, right? Yes. Yeah. That's and correct. I saw where you had an open house when Dr. Barron came. The, that's and, right. That's right. Did, and Dr. Hansen, did they come over to the house as well? The Hansons come over to the Black Cultural Center. Oh, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Nancy was a advocate of the arts, uh, and very a wonderful lady. I guess she always was doing things to get her husband to do certain things. She was pushing for those things. I went to her funeral oh, and uh, sad. her husband, uh, Arthur, was, uh, yeah, as you know, he was a Purdue graduate. Sure. And um, so uh, I, I had a good relationship with him. He supported what we did. Uh, the funny thing is that uh, President Beering was the real, was the person who was instrumental in that building being built. The new facility that they the had. The new facility. Uh -huh. Because um, he had said, stated that if the uh, alumni and so forth, if they could raise, uh, I think, a uh, million dollars, he would put a million to it. And uh, that went on and they raised three million, I believe. And so it was through his uh, intention. One of the things he said that really, really uh, got to me, he said, he didn't want the ghost of Frederick Hub to, to haunt him, <laughs> and so uh, and and so he he was uh, he knew what Hubby had done, and so he carried on and followed up on it. Yeah, that worked out very well then. Very yeah, well. Right, and you still you still do some performing, don't you? Uh, you you come here in the summer, and uh, the saxophone and you are just big buddies, right? That's and my right. And you say jazz is America's gift to the world. There's no other genre like it, like it. I think that's great. Well, it's I'm of the opinion, uh, I, I have a feeling about music that might not be, it may be a little bit different. I think that jazz, which is a creative art form, I don't like the word jazz. I don't know, I know what it connotates, what it meant back in those days, jazz men and so forth. Oh. Uh, but it's creative music and that it comes from the spirit of the soul. It comes with uh, allowing you to improvise and to compose and to do things that are uh, brings out certain qualities in life. I think music is an important facet to get people to come together, uh, uh, soothe the savage beast. It has helped me throughout my career and my lifetime to weather all storms, and out of it, I have sustain and attain a spiritual richness that has helped me in terms of what I was, I felt that I was asked to do to improve the lives of all people. That's very ni nicely said. How about, uh, let me ask this, how about an outstanding event in your life? Do you have an outstanding event, something that comes to your mind? Any outstanding event that you could think of? Well, I guess uh, that, and the, uh, there are several. Certainly the endowment fund because that would help students. Right. And that has grown, and ju just fact, I read a BCC newsletter, and there's a young lady just been awarded a scholarship. The other thing was that uh, I first came here, the lady that I met that I'd heard a lot about was Helen Bass Williams. And uh, you remember her? Yes. Uh, she was actually not wanted here because she was known to be an activist and so forth. But they hired her as a educator, and she implemented that learning center, which is now called the Academic Success Program, that's still at Purdue. 
I, uh, that's the first scholarship named after an African-American woman at Purdue. I'm very proud of that. That's right. Did she come from Illinois? Did you know her before she came here? No. Oh, okay. She was from Culp, oh. Illinois. Oh, okay. But she had been down south during the Freedom Fighter days, and she told me about those experiences that are just unbelievable. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Uh, how they would intimidate them and do certain things to them. Um, a very headstrong, uh, committed lady who was in the uh, Fannie Lou Hamer uh, category. I brought Fannie Lou Hamer to several universities, to, to Illinois. I tried to get her here, but she took sick and couldn't appear. Hmm. How about family? Where'd you meet your wife? Tell us, a little bit of, tell us a little bit about your family. Where'd you meet your wife? I met my wife in Champaign, and I have a wonderful wife. We've been married now going on 57 years. We got married in 1959. And we had our 40th anniversary and invited 300 people in. Just fantastic. And uh, 300 of my closest friends, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it was just great. And, we, and I paid for everything. My wife said, well, I've never really had a party. I said, well, you'll have a party. So I, I paid for everything. And everybody just really said they've never seen anything like that before. <laughs> We did that in Champaign at the Holiday Inn over there. Now it won't be long in 99, in, in, in 09, it'll be our 50th. So we don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> you, got, you got time to plan that anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to want to be involved in that. <laughs> oh, any questions that, uh, that you'd like to ask that weren't, or any closing comments that you'd like to say, anything in closing for the researchers? Anything special? Well, I think one of the most important things that I could say is that here uh, at Purdue, you may recall, there was a lot of resistance that focused on the Black Culture Center back in those days. But today, Purdue has a Hispanic, a Latino cultural center, and they just uh, dedicated an Indian culture center who says that something good has come out of what was been going on that extends to global conditions. I think that the groundwork has been laid for what the center has done and how that can enrich, enrich other cultures and other people, Americans all over the world. Uh, and, and I'm surprised they don't have an Asian culture center because of the number of Asian mm -hmm. alumni, uh, students who attend here. Uh, but I'm just surprised that that hasn't happened. Sure. I would think, I would want to say that there is so much that this country has to offer to the world and that the opportunities are here. We have resources and everything. And I think we should not allow that to get away from us. Right. We should build on what we accomplished, particularly since these are difficult times. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just, I, I ask God to help us to remove ourselves of some of the hatreds, greed, and things that go on, and that we could move, move forward ahead. to a greater America. That's right. Good. Thank you very much, Tony. You're I very really welcome. appreciate that. My pleasure. This concludes the interview. Thank you.